Welcome to season three of And The Writer Is. I am your host, Ross Golan. I've written with hundreds of artists and writers over the years, and my favorite part of each session is the first hour when we catch up about life, the industry, politics, composition, whatever. So this is a journey of learning why people write songs, how people write songs, and most importantly, who the people are who write the songs. I'm producing this with The Great Joe London, Big Deal Music Publishing, and Mega House Music Management. If you want to listen to the songs we discuss in this podcast, follow us on our socials, find out about special events, or buy some of our merchandise, go to our website, www.andthewriteris.com. Oh, and if you enjoy And The Writer Is, please rate and subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or whatever your preferred podcast listening site is. Welcome to And The Writer Is. I am your host, Ross Golan. Today's multi-platinum, number one hit writing, Grammy-nominated writer-producer has made a huge name for himself in the pop world, working with some of the biggest artists in the industry, including Justin Bieber, Selena Gomez, Britney Spears, and Blake Shelton. He is a linchpin in the writing community and might be the most mentioned writer amongst former And The Writer Is guests. And our people ask for his sound because it sounds like the future, but his sound doesn't get in the way of the song. All the way from the San Fernando Valley, this neurotic producer makes me laugh more than any other. And the writer is Ian Kirkpatrick. <laughs> That's the most incredible. Can I tattoo that whole thing on my arm or something? Yeah, but you should have like the the corrections and <laughs> no, like the, all the that stutters the whole and thing. all. Yeah, <laughs> like second dot, takes dot, and dot, all. Cut, yeah, cut. the listeners won't know, but that's actually the thirteenth time he said it, and each time <laughs> got progressively more intense. There was a little, sound a little like sarcasm in there. That was... No, no, uh, no. Uh, okay, so um, hi, Ian. Hey, man. This is awesome. I'm so excited. And by the way, you know, congratulations on the success of this. I oh, certainly have you. learned a lot from about what people really think about me. Because yeah, as you said, most funny. mentioned. There you no, go. Yeah. I think what's weird about the podcast, I don't th- you know, we don't really talk about the podcast on the podcast because it's really meta. But you know, we <laughs> whoa. But like when we were starting this, it was like a year ago, and it's just it's our community and being like, let's just talk about whatever. I don't know something a conversation that our community can have with ourselves, not in like an ego way, but like so that way when we're old, it can be like, oh yeah, we're friends with each other, and that's what they were like and when Remember they were that young. Old podcast yeah, we did. I don't know. There was something about just documenting it, not expecting other people to listen to it. Yeah. And I think what's been fun is like one at a time, just trying to whittle our way through our community of writers and just kind of have conversations and it's and it's been it's fun to just <laughs> yeah. kind of go through just which is literally the best part recap. of maybe the best part of the of the job is like the is the people you meet cuz every writer is a little crazy every producer is well, maybe not every producer is but you know neurotic or like just a little OC2 OCD yeah so the character where does your OCD come from oh my gosh besides the caffeine I, no, but I in like know. a real way. Oh, in a, I don't you, know. You know, you I used have. to draw like really detailed drawings of like factories, like make up like tree recycling factories that would create things. And my dad would walk by and be like, "You're paranoid," <laughs> like like something is you know a little Wait, in a what nice were you way. Drawing? You know, little like schematics of like you know factory belts that would like you know this is not interesting. We don't have to talk about the the sources of OCD. Where does any OCD? No, that come is from? interesting. But, where, where, but it's like details. You know, like little detailed stuff. How old were you when you were doing that? Oh my God, six, seven. This is like a long, 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 it's like a couple years ago. Are you good at math? I was when I was in uh, college. When you were in college? Speaking of math, there's a lot of math to songwriting, guys. We, okay, so yeah, no, right. So we jumped from like trying to get six, to the transition six, let, to something go, interesting. <laughs> <laughs> let's go. No, I want to tell a little bit of your story. Because like that explains a lot of who people are, and to me, I think that explains why they write music the way they do. Is telling a little bit of their story. So yeah. let's go from the it's, beginning. You're born to to whom and where? I'm born to my, my what my mom. Sure. What, what is that like? Uh, who are your parents? My parents, Rosie and Michael. The 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 uh, you know the foundation. Sure. Um, are they musicians? My mom is a, you know a painter. 
an artist. Is that her job? No. She was, I mean, she's retired now, but uh, she was, I mean, she was like a secretary. Uh-huh. You know, she was, but, but a very, she was like very, she's very intensely smart, like had a degree in psychology, but then met my dad and just now she's in the kitchen all the time. That's a joke. That's not true at all. They got divorced. <laughs> I don't really want to talk about it. <laughs> No, they all that a, out. When did they cut get? All that out. <laughs> sure. No, um, my mom was like into psychology and a painter, and my dad is a total, you know, hippie. Like, was they, I think he met my mom in Paris when he was making chocolate, chocolate mousse or something like that. I don't really know the story very well because it always changes. But like, it's they're both very eclectic people, and I think that you know me now that makes me an Irish Moroccan Jew, which is like the weirdest. Maybe that's where the OCD comes from. I mean, 100%. I mean, like Middle Eastern blood and Irish blood. And anyway, are you, so you're first generation American? Yeah, born here. But Although I spoke here. French for like the first two years of my life, apparently. Do you speak any French now? A little bit. Not well, though. It's kind of, I, I'm kind of embarrassed by that. Like, I want to take French now to girls, girls like that. <laughs> did you, did you grow up in a? Um, no, no, they don't. <laughs> um, <laughs> did you, Fine. Did you grow up Italian. in a community that was like, was there a Moroccan community or anything like that? Like, no, no. So it was sort of like you guys were on an island. <sighs> yeah, we were like lower middle class at the bottom of the hill in Encino. You know, public school, everything, but. My parents got a drum set for me when I was five, and there's the genesis. And, did and you I, take? No, no, didn't take uh, any drum lessons, but was always playing in like really interesting bands. And by interesting, I mean terrible. Like up until high school, and then I think also part of the OCD, you know, in the production and stuff, and the details comes from the Aphex Twin, who was like my favorite, favorite composer. And his stuff and like Square Push or Not Tech, or they all go like so detailed. And then I had this aspiration to, over the years, it's become my aspiration to like bring that into pop, you know, all the little cuts and stuff. And like, I love that shit. Did you play live? Yes, very. But I was, <laughs> I was the one that was always like, you'd see like the pictures before the sets, and I was always sweating already because I was so nervous. And so I think that also was a big part because even as a drummer like you're behind everything but I was still so nervous to play live like just having people stare at you like even right now <laughs> um, it's, what was what was the name of the band and that you would you know like did you have a band when you were oh, it wasn't in particular that you were in for a while or was it more that you just kind of played with whoever I played with whoever friends you know there was there was a band called middle room that I think that was like the first time I ever played to a metronome it was it was amazing. It was terrible. I mean, it was awful. That was the first time I was in a studio ever, with like the double glass doors and everything, and it was really intimidating. Are you do you have that recording? It'd be interesting to hear that now. This is where you faded in. Yeah, <laughs> it's like my terrible playing. <laughs> oh my god! Do you, do you have a you have a sibling, right? Yeah, I have a younger sister. Does She's she younger? Does she play instruments? She doesn't. She lives uh, in San Francisco, and she is. I mean, she's like, she knows everything there is to know about wine, cheese, and weed. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, I think she's she took she takes more after my father. Like, she's so fucking smart in very specific areas. <laughs> like, I don't know. Now she's like a weed expert. She's working for some incredible like, I don't know what do you call them plantations. Sure. What do you, what do you call the weed places? Yeah, weed yeah. farms. Yeah, weed farm. A weed farm. I don't know if but that's yeah. right. Um, did you DJ? Yes, because like when you're talking about like Aphex Twin and all that stuff, like those guys I tried are, to be. are, I mean, they're producers, but, <clears throat> but I they, think that's like really that's, that's they put on sad. shows too yeah. that are like insane. I tried for a minute, and the thing was that you know I got like the Technics 1200s, and I was like you know listening to you know Cut Chemist and Kid Kid Koala and all those like weird DJ uh, vinyl guys, but vinyl was so expensive, and I was just a broke high school kid, so I couldn't continue. What's your uh, what was your DJ name? <laughs> DJ IXL. Which it's is so embarrassing. I, like I accelerate. <laughs> is that what it was? Yeah. But it's like the letters but IXL. IXL. Yeah. And then 
and and then in college, does that just mean like BPMs? Just you just keep. I don't know. BPMs? I don't know what I like, was thinking. Like what is that? I excel. I mean, where do I any excel like I accelerate, but not like I excel like like oh, maybe like really I well. excel at. I could have been like I excel at things, but I didn't really excel at things. I don't Are you know. A good student. No, no. I was always on the computer. In bet- I mean, I I got like you know B's, and I didn't get into most of the colleges that I wanted to, just because. I spent so much time at home on my computer. What college did you end up going to? I ended to? up going to UC Santa Cruz. I mean, thank God they accepted me. But I went for economics. And I started a minor in electronic music, which I thought would be cool. But oh, they had a minor in they that? They did. But by that time, like I was, you know, this is another thing maybe with the OCD. It's like when I start to do something, like when I heard the Aphex Twin, that was in like 98 maybe. And I was like, that's when I was like, I need a computer. Because drumming is not going to let me do all these crazy things and chopping and stuff. So I, I just started, you know, when I get an idea, like I have to go learn everything about it. So when I got to the minor, it was just like, dude, like I know all this, and you know, this is they they were just not not on my level. No, they just didn't get they didn't get geeky enough, you know. And it was just like, and the, can, I don't even know if I can say this. He won't listen. He, the teacher smelled bad. He was always had this like reek of body odor. It was really offensive, and it ruined it for me. Totally. I always think of Mr. Keen, who was my algebra teacher from when I was in seventh grade. Are they not aware of it? And there are certain things where, like, I smell certain people, and I think of like how he used to just like chain smoke on his breaks, come into the like seventh grade math room, and be like, "Wow, you smell so think of cigarettes so bad," and his breath was just like. Out of control with coffee and anyway, this is sort of besides the point. Um, yeah, what were we talking about? Oh, for uh, school. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I did. I, so I did that minor smelly for like five minutes. Smelly teacher. Teacher was too smelly. Quit the minor. Just kept doing did stuff you on my own. School? I did. I got a degree in economics. Nice. Yeah, my degree is signed by Arnold Schwarzenegger. What? Oh, yeah. It's, he, a Cal, it's a Cal it's California. School? Yeah, but again, that you know. I was I was always doing it's like you know I was always doing music on the side and then I graduated and and I met Dan who's now my manager and, how, and life coach. <laughs> how, how did you meet Dan? I met Dan through my friend Omri, actually before college, and he was like, <laughs> he was like, um, you know, I have like a few grand. I'm going to buy this hard disk recorder, and uh, my friend said, you you know, like to record stuff. You want to do something? I'm like, sure, <laughs> why not. And we like I graduated and immediately. We were in his mom's garage recording like shitty local bands, and slowly over the years, I was also building websites. Did you know you were? Did you know you were a producer, or were no. you like, no, I can engineer this? Were you an engineer or a producer? I was. I was both. But the thing, like, I always love to hear stories about people. Like, I wanted to do music. I came to LA, and I and I had because I don't have that story. I was doing. I was always. I was just always doing music, but then it slowly started taking up more time, and it was like, oh, this is now a job, you know. Even though I had to live at home till I don't know twenty nine, because you know, you don't make. I don't know. Whatever. What? It's hard. It's a struggle to. Rec- I mean, you don't make that much. Well, first of all, you can make money recording bands. You can have a studio business, and for a while that was it. But then when I, I, you know, I started writing on the projects I was producing, and then I got a publishing deal, and it was like, oh my god, pop! Like you can, like, and then then it like slowed down. Then it was like, you know, I didn't get a cut for two years. I think after I got my publishing deal. How old are you when you got your publishing deal? Fuck, 20, 26. And what, it was was it always with Warner Chapel? Always Warner Chapel. And Dan did with Mark Wilson. Mark Wilson hit me up on MySpace. No way. Yeah, like bro, because we went to elementary school together. You and Mark? Yeah, and apparently at a talent show, I, I played the drums at a talent show and he was in the audience. He's like, dude, like I still remember that performance. Wow. Yeah, and, and then he, I mean he claims, I don't know if this is true. He claims that like that got him inspired and he started playing bass after that. Like he got into music, and which eventually, like, you know, by then he'd already been working for Warner Chapel. And he was like, Oh, I just always thought about that show, and like here you are, you know, we should talk. I work for Warner Chapel. And I was like, no way. And you were just coincidentally still in music, and now you're yeah. starting to record local bands and stuff. like yeah. that. Yeah, I mean, I was I was doing a lot of Warp Tour bands that were right. you know on Fearless Records, and which was awesome because they would they would you know actually pay me to produce stuff, and it wasn't just weird local kids. You know, it was like bands that actually had a following, and you know I could go on YouTube and read like this sucks, and I'd be like, oh nice, you know, people are commenting on things. 
but you know, yeah, after getting, I don't know, when you start writing songs, is, is, it's just, it's, it's difficult. Right. And that was when I was finding all, you know, all my, who would become my people. Was there a point where you're like, you know, the DJ thing's not going to work out and like, you know. <laughs> that was, that like, was a long. That was long before yeah, that. Yeah, I mean, I, w- I would DJ parties in, in college with vinyl, with like, so which, me- which meant you had 30 songs right. and then you had to turn on a stereo because it was like, all right, guys, that's the set you have probably heard like eight times. It was like Fatboy Slim and Chemical Brothers and sure. uh, fuck, Basement Jacks. Yeah. Shout out Basement Jacks. So good. The best. Um, I, you, I think the first thing I remember coming to LA, because there was just the DJ scene where I grew up was non existent and hip hop was non existent. And I just remember coming to LA and, and it was like all West Coast rap and, and people listening to ATB. Oh Do you my remember God. Remember that? Da, 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 yeah. yeah. The piano thing, the bendy piano notes. And it was just like, it's like the cheesiest kind of like melody don't, thing. Don't stop, that, stop. And the cover of his his album is like him in front of a private jet. This is ATB. And I was just You're like, like oh, that's I remember I saying to, saying to um, people in my school, it's like, <clears throat> nah, electronic music is going to be where music is. But it was like a... Um, you know, jazz and classical influence music program at the time. Like there just wasn't really a pop program like there is now, and and it took a long time to be like, no, this is like, this is what the future is. And you, you know, there you had teachers who were like, no, it's always going to be analog. It'll never be digital because ha. digital doesn't sound as good. I and you have all the me. kids in their their rooms like using Reason. And trying to like be like, no, no, you're crazy. <clears throat> like, check out this sound and this sound. Yeah, actually, that that reason was the first program. Propeller Heads Reason was the first program that it was like, this is freedom. This is freedom to create. And also, I was on that wave. I was thinking that you know, electronic music is the future. And then I heard when I heard you know, I was doing Warped Tour stuff, and then Panic of the Disco came out, the record that Matt Squire did, where it was like techno, and you know, rock, and it was like, this is this is it. And that's what that's what like helped you know give me the confidence to think that I could put all those weird electronic stuff. Thank you, Matt. Shout out, Matt. Shout out, Matt Squire. Um, Legend of the of the bands you started working with. I assume you know playing White Tees is part of that. And, oh yeah. You know when you started doing that, and then you start doing like your first hits with Breathe Carolina, but that's all the way 2011. So. You have like a, a few years in there of just kind of like grinding through, meandering, and trying, meandering. Yeah, those those few years are definitely when I started trying to do pop, because because that was like the competition for songs. There was just you know you're competing with the Max Martins and you know Doctor Luke's, and it's like I think that's why I didn't get a cut for so long because it was just, it's just really difficult. But yeah. I liked the challenge, but at the same time, it was like. I know you're you're big on the math, and I learned a lot from you actually with respect to that. Which is, we actually met because of Breathe Carolina. You remember? Yeah. You came in with a song idea. Yeah. Uh, I think it was like. Yeah. Mile High Club or something like that. Yeah, that shit was. And it was. Fire. It, I mean, it was for 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 that time. Yeah. Maybe still actually. Did you ever write that song? No, I. I mean, the thing is, like, I always like coming in with some sort of concept and melody to start. Yeah. I remember being so impressed with you. I was like, "Damn, this guy's for real." Because you were one of the for real writers. I think like that week I met Cash too, and he was so not interested. <laughs> he was like, "I had played him some beats." He's like, "Yeah, man. Like, yeah, like send me that one. I guess I don't know." <laughs> <laughs> it's really funny. <laughs> I was like, "Cool." Well, it's I guess weird because like everyone, everyone tries to find their own footing, and and it's you know, there's something about generations of writers. Where like for sure, there's a generation after us that's like that's becoming friends and are working together. Yeah, who are like itching to just to just kind of like take over, and they're gonna end up with have moments like Cash is having or Tranner's having. You know, you know, yeah. where there it's gonna be the next generation soon enough. And yeah. it's just interesting because do you remember being that like the up and comer? Yeah, I still feel like I'm a, I'm an up and comer in so many ways, and that's what's so strange when people who are younger are or newer kind of look look for advice, and you're like, yeah, but I mean, I got a lot to learn still. Yeah, I'm not even, I'm not sure it's like achievements that make you not an up and comer. It's just like if you've been doing it long enough, you start to yeah. think like I'm not I'm not that anymore. Even though, yeah, like every day, 
that's the thing about yeah. songwriting is it, 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 every day there's like some new thing you're like, oh, this week I'm on, you know, opposites, and now I want to like, you know, do contrast or let's get let's start with the chorus. Let's start with the chorus. I heard this one song, you know, or it's like there's well, yeah. no like general rule or you know, just to write to write is like the most like the first thing people do. I think is like they they go through this phase of they walk in the room, they write, and they just write a song, and there's no intention. And there's no like, you know, there's just such a difference between writing a song and writing a song that can compete. Yeah. Like it's so easy to write a song. You pick up an instrument, you don't even need to pick up an instrument, just start yeah. singing a melody and throw some lyrics on it. But if you're going to really like craft something that, that'll stick out and, and eventually move its way into the zeitgeist, like you have to compete with, you know, the, the greatest <sighs> writers in the, in the game right now are writing. You know, five songs a week, every week, all yeah. year long. So for you to compete with that, that means you have to outright that, and yeah. that just seems daunting as shit. It, well, what, but the still other, seems daunting. The other side of it, though, is that like you know, I think Charlie Puth said he wrote "See You Again" in fifteen minutes. It's like, wait, what? Right. I mean, like, there's no like general, and then there's other songs like I remember Tom Higginson told me that he wrote "Hey There, Delilah." And it took him like six months to finish the lyrics. Yeah, it's it's just there's no default, which is that's daunting to me. That like you know, like like. But ev- that's a good example of somebody. Who's, sorry to interrupt, but there's, that's a good example of. I was about I, to make the best point of the podcast. Yeah. Like, I don't know why. You know. I'm really hungover today, and like a train of thought for me is rare right now. So, so don't interrupt that. The, so, the if it's going, let it go. See what happens. <laughs> you have like pro- prodigies, and you have you have like people who are schooled. You know, you have some people. I do think that people like. I think Charlie Puth is pretty rare. Totally. You know, I think most people are people who have to edit their way through. Genius. <laughs> Charlie's one of the guys you get angry at. He's like, he's so good. You're like, man, how old are you again? Damn it, you know. Around that time where you have Breathe Carolina, you end up having a song that goes top 40. I mean, Blackout's pretty big. Number like, 13, I think. That was a huge deal. That's a huge deal. That mean that got me sessions. I mean, I think that got me session with you. That got me a session with Bonnie, which I totally failed at. It was like I was hot for a minute after that song. I got a bunch of like, you know, meetings with people. And that was like actually an important lesson because I got a bunch of meetings and I got a bunch of really good sessions and I just, I didn't really capitalize on it because I wasn't like fast enough in person and I got really nervous. Like I was in the room with Bonnie. I was like, oh my God, oh my God, Bonnie McKee. And then, you know, I, and then I was like, then I couldn't get any sessions anymore after a while. And it was like, shit, I get how it goes now. Like I have to have something and then people think you're, you know, I'm as good as I was, but I have happen to not have anything, you know, popping right now. So can't get a session with, you know, Ross Golan. I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, you were writing with. I mean, you wrote Blackout with Simon Wilcox. Yes. So, like, you're you're already writing though with people who, like, you're you're already starting to develop the community. Yeah. That we're gonna get into. Yeah. And I was and then working with Lindy, next, Lindy yeah. Robbins, and their lot, which is, and then that's how I met Julia Michaels. And I feel like I should say last names. Sure. No, right? that works. But um, yeah, that, I mean, that's when you start finding your people during that. During that that two year struggle of like trying to get a cut with an artist on a major label, that's when I met most of the people I still work with today. Like that's when I met the real. Those are the real friends, you know. Like Julia Michaels is like my little sister. Like I literally love her, and am you know vastly annoyed by her sometimes. It's that kind of relationship. But that's what makes the writing with you know like when I write with you, I'm writing with my friends. It's it's the the well, this this is the community we we ended up talking about it a little bit with Lindy and with Julia and Sean and Evigan like this this it, Simon Yo, this it's so much love right like it's it is it's, genuine like fam family in a sense that like if I see the monsters or something like that it's like the biggest hug you yeah. can get if you see stuff you're gonna get like you know you pointed this out I think it was like years ago at some camp you were like it's so funny because in the you know back in the day like it was it used to be so cutthroat and competitive and now it's just like everyone's everyone else's cheerleader you know and it's so like oh you know uh, Nolan got a, got this song it's like oh fuck yeah Nolan I love that guy or the monsters have this fuck yeah man that's great you know it's so it's so heartwarming 
And it's like it's a choice, you get excited right? for sessions because they're your friends. And I was like, this person, oh man, this person has number one right now. This is gonna be sick. It's like, no, it's like, oh, it's fucking Joe. Dude, Joe London, like, fuck yeah, let's go, you know, let's go get coffee. And like what I love about your like the sessions we do, we talk for two hours. And the song will come out of that conversation, you know, which is I think my favorite way to write. Yeah. I try to, I try to wow, I've learned so much from you. What? Seriously. All the math, because you were, you know, you were one of the only people I was working with that had worked with Max. So you were so like calculated, and that just resonates with the OCD. I love that. Even, but yeah. calculated in a smart way, not like this has to be like this. It's like here's where you can employ this math. The hardest you know, thing that I try, I, I, I get this really ends up being envious. a Roscoe in interview. Yeah, it's weird. I, I, I get really envious when people are like, um, when somebody's like, no, I, I get the math, but I like this better. Ooh. And they stick with it. Ego. And you get into this, this thing of like, okay, <clears throat> sometimes at, you have, like, the, I, I think the magic comes in that, that initial impulse, like how, how I sing over certain chords or how yeah. you write certain chords around certain melodies or whatever. And then you edit through with, the knowledge of like, oh yeah, well this actually helps and this doesn't. Yeah. Like personally. Yeah. But it's amazing how many times like I'm around somebody who's like, yeah, I'd, I want to, I want to go here, and I believe in this, and to say, okay. Yeah. Well, there's a, see, is, that, that. That I mean, that's like the even more meta part about writing sessions is that not only are you like a skilled songwriter, but you're a skilled session haver. You know, for instance. You won't stop a session in the first verse and be like, I don't like that lyric. You'll wait till the song's written. So now no one's as precious about that lyric in the first verse. And it's like, now, you know, it's not about your critique, it's about the timing of your critique. It's like, there's an art, like, and that's like the wave I'm trying to be on is like, how can I get the most out of these top liners in a session? How can I make them comfortable? You know, do I bring drugs? Like, (laughs) (laughs) but what's weird is like, okay, so top liners all know the producers because they go producer to producer, producer, but we don't get to work with each other. Yeah. And same thing with it's like, you're not necessarily working with a ton of producers. But I guess this is a little different of a generation where you obviously work a lot with Monsters and Strangers and some other producers. But where do you learn how to run a session? I mean, that for for me personally, Mm -hmm. that. So before I was just writing, you know, doing songs for pitch and working with, you know, singular artist like a Dua Lipa or something, it was bands. I was doing Plain White Tees, Breathe Carolina, the Neon Trees, Young the Giant. Like I was, I was producing bands, and that was a lot of work. And 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 I think part of the reason why I started just doing, you know, writing for pop was because that was just that was killing me. It was like you had to become a psychologist and you had to balance five different people's egos and I, you know the guitar player would be like yo can I can I talk to you for a second like yo a uh, fucking you know Chad our ba- Chad our bass Chad's such a bass player name mm-hmm. Chad the bass player is like he's being a dick you know I just want to make sure we do this and I'm like oh okay cool cool and then like 10 minutes later Chad's like yo yo Ian let me talk to you man you know yo fucking Rick our guitar player what's a good guitar <laughs> player name yeah, Steve this, Steve's yeah. a guitar player name Steve is like being a total dick, man. Like, what the hell? I'll be like, yeah, yeah, cool. And it would be that. It would just be like and infighting. You're like, Listen, Chad, I know Steve's being a dick, <laughs> but Rick had a good point. No, then you'd right. You'd have to have a powwow. Yeah, you know, like Rick right, had a everybody. Good point let's you know what? Kevin's come trying back to say the, something. Come here. back in the control room. Let's like let's just let's <laughs> cut it right here. Let's talk. You know, we go in the kitchen. Let's you know what? Let's take a break. Like that's that's where I think I started to realize that there was an art to you know how cohesive a session goes, and also where I realized I don't want to work with. Full bands anymore because it's like three months of your life. I mean, you you know this, Joe. You're you produce you st- you you do projects, you know, and it's like it's 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 stressful, especially when band members aren't getting along. Yeah, a lot of drama. We kind of have a similar arc where we go. We're working with all these bands, and we're working with like we're, we're working in the, like the this alternative space, and then our first like money making song is a country song. <laughs> Kind of. I mean, well, ble- I guess Breathe Carolina is before this with Blackout, but Blake Shelton, you have a song and it becomes so a, random. It, it's on a number one I mean, country album that wins the CMA like <laughs> album of the year and everything. And you're like, not a country dude. Yeah. How did that happen? Uh, I mean, that song was written, I think it was written for someone else. 
and then was around for like a year. And that was one that was one of the first demos that I sang. And I did it with piano. And then all of a sudden it was a Blake Shelton song. And it was like, but that that cut for some reason gave me so much cred. It was like, you have a Blake Shelton cut, like, that's incredible. And then I started going to Nashville more to write. That's when I met like the real storytellers. I mean, that's a whole nother tangent, but Nashville is like <laughs> real musicians. <laughs> I feel like an idiot when I go out there. They're like, let's take three, five to the one. I'm like, what? <laughs> well, every everyone here has a specialty. It's like, oh, I'm a I'm a verse lyricist. Not not really, but like on some level, people are <laughs> I'm a, like, I'm really good. At, I do bridges really well. Yeah, there's always somebody who does like bridge master. Well, especially during like the during the drop phase, <laughs> <laughs> you were killing that. Oh yeah, the dubstep bridge. Yeah, the dubstep bridge. Um, oh, those shout those out dubstep. Killed me. Um, yeah, that shit was difficult. It's like cut out half of what we do. Well, one third of what we do. But um, <laughs> but the well, idea of like there's specialties, and in Nashville, it's like oh no, everybody also plays an instrument. Everybody very also well too. writes lyrics, and everyone also sings, and ev- everyone does a little bit of everything at least. Yeah. And here it's like in the pop world, it's there are people who just do drums. Yeah. Yeah, and that's like a strange. Well, also in Nashville, there's like, oh, I know that my keyboard guy or my drum guy. I mean, they're very specialized there too. Yeah, they just don't get credit as writers, right? So like, no one thinks of putting them as part of like, like putting them in the writing (laughs) session. I feel like if you ever get lost in 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 the LA like pop game, you go to Nashville to ground yourself again and be like, this is songwriting, and if and then you take little bits of Nashville back and and you know bring it to LA and be like, because they're just all it's all feeling there. You know? And they're all nice and positive. Yes. So you walk away, you're like, you know what? I wrote ten hits. None of them get cut. None of them. But I was like, Man, everyone, that everyone is gets so put positive. on hold though. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, cool. For like a year and a half. So um, you what come out about? of uh, it's like 2014. This is probably right when you and I really start kind of working together. So I'm starting to follow a little bit of what's happening. Yeah. I'm bad with years and like how old I was. I don't. I just, but you you work on the Nick Jonas album. You start having yes. some stuff on Nick Jonas, and um, and this is right around when you do these like writing camps amongst this group of writers, and shit. I wish I had a name for them. Like oh, like the the infamous five or like the, something. Yeah. Like that. So the infamous no five, which is probably seventeen people. Yeah, there was but, actually more than five. You end up with probably, you know, maybe top ten biggest radio song of the last ten years, kind of thing with "Want to Want Me." Yeah, and that like that like, was written in Arrowhead at one of those little. I mean, that's that's like the Lindy Robbins cr- crew. Yeah, she amassed Evigan, Mitch Allen, Julia, Sam Martin, me, and I was like the. I think me and Julia were like the only ones that didn't have any songs on the radio at that point. <laughs> and yeah, that came from. I mean, I think that was like our second, the second time we did that little camp. Did you know that was a hit when you finished it, or at that point, since you're like, well, I haven't really had the cuts yet, it's like no. it's just a song. I, 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 I didn't know ever myself, but that was the first time I got email responses from Mike Karen that were like, "This is a smash," but you should do this first. And I didn't know. I mean, you know, Mike Karen was a big reason that song is a hit. Is Mike Karen? You know, he we had like he was like you should try this chord in the chorus and do something high here. You know, like just the right amount of suggestion to like. Thank you, Mike Karen. Exactly, he's a G. I haven't talked to him on email since I don't know an hour. <laughs> yeah, you know, Mike Karen. Also, a quick story is that that Mike Karen was like he was fucking with me for two years, and I was just kept letting him down. He would give me opportunity after opportunity. Like that guy knows how to identify potential. Yeah, you know, and he 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 kept like he stayed on it, so super shout out, much respect. You end up becoming kind of the sound of Jason Derulo during this time with you know. Thank you. The having Cheyenne right after that. Yeah, Cheyenne. Cheyenne kind of became, and I'm curious because like I know you have big hits after this, so I don't mind asking. But Cheyenne was one of those songs where it was like it it obviously didn't do as well as the previous song. There had to be a feeling of you know, you're about to have the second single, so you know, cash the let's start cashing checks now and then and then it doesn't really work. Why do you yeah. think it didn't work? Um well I think and I and I've said this to the monsters, that was I uh, one of the first co productions I ever did and the song is grossly overproduced. 
And like we both, me, uh, myself, and the monsters learned from that song because we just, uh, it was like missing something. And we just threw everything at it. But I think, I don't know what, for, I mean, you know, the, the song, you know, why does any song not work? I don't know. Like, I, I, but honestly, I didn't, I, I didn't, I, 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 I like, it didn't work out. And I was like, cool. But I think I'd had so much time before the hit of just being constantly disappointing, constantly disappointed. And, that it just it was just like ah oh, that's just what happens you know you like kind of my, fall back into the, like the my new theory on 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 the best like who are the best songwriters and producers are the people that lose the best like if you can be not precious about like a song doesn't get cut it's like I don't care I'll I'll I'll, I'll work on a song all day like we'll we'll work on an idea for five hours be like you know fuck this let's start something new it's like the best songwriters I know the best producers I know are the least precious. And have the most like confidence in themselves. Like you know what? I'll, I know I'll have another. I mean, I hope I'll have another good idea. But I'm pretty sure I will. So I'm not going to get too attached to this. You know, you put your heart and soul into it, but then once it's done or you realize it's not working, you can just move on without any sort of like damage. And that takes. And you know, when you get critique back on a song, to actually be like, you know what? If I was a money producer, I'd be able to satisfy everyone. Let's see if I can do that instead of being like, she doesn't like it. Oh man, like what did I do wrong? It's like when you can separate yourself from your work, you know, when you learn how to lose gracefully, it's like, you know, people are like, some young writers are like, I have this song, this, this one song, and it's like, I hear it, and I'm like, this sucks, dude. Write another one though, you know, this part was great, write another one. And it's like, it's, it's so heartbreaking. Like, yeah, it's all the, the it's the best, the, the, the best losers. Are the most successful. I, I think so. Or the least precious. Not best losers. I mean, that sounds so like mean, but it's no, not, but not it's what I mean. Not. But you know, like losing as in like not a song doesn't get cut or something. It's like you just you just write more. Yeah, you have you can swallow your pride enough to move on to the next song. Yeah. Like, and there's like there's no don't, it. you know, no ego, no I mean, this is why it's great to write with, you know, you guys. It's like we know each other and we don't we're not worried about hurting each other's feelings, you know. It's like we're just here to try to write a great song and you know, we don't care if we work on a song for all day and then it, nothing happens from it. You know, um, Mile High Club never got cut. Yeah, and I'm still hurting. Frankly, I actually don't know what's happened. <sighs> yeah, in the that last was all a lie. I cry every day. <laughs> yeah, the last five years have been brutal for me because of that. Um, um, you prick, <laughs> dude. That was a, that. You you have to bring up my weakest moment is to bring up Mile High Club. I'm. Um, I think that's that's sage advice. You have thank you. <laughs> you have um, you have to wait twenty minutes into the wait. How long is the podcast? Yeah, um, it's been six hours, I think. Okay. Um, so you have the feeling featuring Halsey that comes out on on Bieber's album, and I think what's what's kind of crazy about that is that that gets that gets you the the Grammy nomination. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like of all the things that you work on in your life, you just never know like what's the song or what's the you know. Yep. And I think, the, yeah. the timing of it, it's just fascinating that it's like you, you know, it's a song that you like and then it gets cut and then it Maybe that's that that randomness, like you just throw a million things at the wall and see what sticks yeah. and like you don't know where what song's going to do well. Like I didn't know New Rules was a hit. You know, I was mad that like Travis Scott was not on the bridge. He was supposed to do the bridge. And then I was like, man, like that sucks. Like, why is this not happening? And then Jeff Fenster the other day is like, do you realize how much that would have fucked the song up? The message, the video, I'm like, oh my God, I don't know anything. I don't know anything. And that's probably what contributes to the, lo- to the lack of like being precious. It's like, man, I didn't see that coming. Or I really hoped for that one and it didn't work. It's like, I didn't know that was going to be a Grammy on a Grammy nominated record. It's insane. Levels. Is another one of those same with monsters and really similar to Cheyenne, except for like to me, I like Cheyenne and I think that there's a purpose in slowing down the tempo after an up tempo, all that stuff for like when that's a single. Levels to me is like, and we've we've discussed this um, with Nick too. Like, mm. how did Levels not work? To me, that's oh, I know a hit. how it works. I know how it didn't work. I love that song. That's that song didn't work because of. One week of uh, uh, like I, I, some research came back not good. It was too early to do the research. It was at something like you know, and 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 this is maybe a good story for people to hear. They're like it was, I think we were in. I was in the studio with the monsters at the time, who I who I co-produced a song with, and it was like I don't know thirteen, 
with a bullet of 1200. And we were like, this is so fucking great. And like, Mike Karen's like, good, great job, man. This is, this is a good one for you. And I'm like, I'm so excited. Everyone's like, how the fuck did you do this production? That's crazy, which is really fascinating. There's some really crazy shit in that song that involves like oscillators and half steps and stuff. That's crazy. But the research came back not good. And then they just yanked it. And then the next fucking week, it was like number one research. It was like, fuck, you know, what the hell? And it's like that, I, I mean, I don't know. That's my, also maybe the song was just not, you know, didn't resonate with people. I don't know. That also is the reason why maybe. But like, you know, there is some business stuff that just doesn't work out, timing or something like that. I mean, so, we'll get to it in a little bit, but the same thing happened with Fresh Eyes. When, by the time I got research, it was the highest research song I've ever yeah. written. Dude, how and long it, were they And pushing? the research came in after they stopped pushing the song. Or, but on some level, radio stations start reading, you know, if it starts to drop on its own before research comes it's fear in based. or something. It's fear-based mar- yeah. marketing. I mean, how long, how long, did, how long was uh, Charlie Puth's attention on the charts? Dude, New Rules was, on the, was like, it's like 200 days or something like that. And yeah. it's just like the slowest builder. And attention went number one. Because people have faith in a song or something, you know that, and I think that maybe you know levels was one person's lesson at a label. It was like, oh yeah, you know, fuck, we pulled the plug on this one too soon or something like that. Yeah, and, and when it comes down to it, it's still a human. There's yeah. still a human who makes with these with good intentions too, and it's like no one's evil. There's no like you know no yeah. one's trying to sabotage it, but like. But when people say that, like for a hit song to work, it takes all these things that have to fall into place, and you think, no, no, I just need to write a hit song and it'll take care of itself. But on some level, somebody along Levels. the way can totally, yeah, yeah, exactly. Wait, can you real quick? Because <laughs> somebody's gonna be like, why didn't you ask him about those crazy oscillator half step things? Oh gosh, just tell me when you were like, oh, there's some crazy things with levels. Oh, well, because I, I would urge everyone it, to explore, but... every producer to explore contact. And the script editor, and you know, because because it's because the the song came from accidentally throwing the speakerphone plug in on another song, and it had an os- oscillator that was just like, like it was like set to oscillate a one semitone down, one semitone up. So then I replicate. I, so I heard that effect. I'm like, oh my god, that's incredible! And I just had a bass line that was just. And I put it on, it goes. So it's three half steps yeah. just oscillating back and forth. And it was like the coolest shit ever. Learn contact, it's worth it. Best uh, sampler out there. The next song that's on your list is Good to Be Alive. Yes. Which is pretty fun because we wrote that together. Yes. Oh, and what a fun everything. Every part of that song. Remember when you brought the whole fucking choir into energy for that? Yeah, that, I mean, Part of the choir ended up being some of you know Andy's wife and his dad too. It's just, but yeah, that that was incredible. I I think what's amazing about that, and I tell people this, and I think it's my, it's either my second or my third most valuable song, whether somebody knows it or not. Oh, yeah. The amount of licenses that it got, and the <laughs> yeah, amount what's of that like, about? You know, I don't know. Whatever it was, the fact that it grabbed. It grabbed a certain time or something, and the way it feels, it, f- it feels fresh, but it d- feels retro, but it doesn't feel retro. Yeah. I don't know how to repeat That's, that kind of thing. Oh, uh, yeah. I don't know. I mean, maybe just hang out with Andy. Yeah, exactly. Because <laughs> it's literally like he's one of those people that you feel, it's like, oh man, it's good to be alive. Today was a great day. I'm like, why? Oh, probably because I wrote with Andy. Like, he's so happy all the time. And I feel but, like we but, laugh harder in those sessions than. Maybe yeah. any other sessions. I yeah. don't know what it is, but the combination is it's very been enjoyable. Pretty great, actually. I mean, the next time we got together was Fresh, it's Fresh Eyes. Eyes, which is the which was the second highest rate uh, research song in Australia last year, Lit. behind Shape of You. Really? It was an it was rated one hundred on Hot AC Research. Whoa! Um, and that. On um, positivity or something like that, right when it started to drop in the U.S., and that you know it's a platinum selling song. That's to me that song is like if I gave an example of how you can write a song that has emotion that is still compositionally sound. Yeah, that's like that's like my favorite structured actual song. 
that maybe I've I've been a part of. From from the producer's point of view, what I love about that song is that the majority of the vocal was the one that we did the day we wrote it on the couch. I mean, you're like talking in the background of some of it. Really? Yeah. It's 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 like the guitar is most of the guitar is the, gu- the guitar the, the guitar you played. No, he played guitar on that. Did I play guitar on that? You had you played the riff in the beginning. He played guitar on it too, but some of the guitar that I used oh, is that from I that day. Maybe he played. Oh, it. I don't know. It, but it was it's basically the point being it was all from the day we wrote it. Yeah. And very like we we redid vocals and it was like nah man the feeling's there like just handheld SM7. There's bleed in it and everything, and it's so like. Well, the thing that's interesting about that song, and and it came from a real story. Do you remember the story? Yeah, it's not mine. It was Andy's. It's Andy's story. Yeah, I love that. Like he always finds a way to, you know, the when people think edgy means saying the word fuck or shit, or edgy Ross. means you have to talk about sex. Yeah. What? It's like Ross, don't cuss. No, oh, gosh. Oh my god. But like people say that they're always like, "Oh, we need edgy," so they think edgy means it's just the cheapest form of edginess is to swear. Yeah. And there's like there are ways That's to be edgy, edgy by by being witty, and he finds a way to talk about something that is that like we all can agree on that feels a little like uncomfortable to say. Is fresh is edgy. Well, I mean, the whole idea of it, I think, came from like you haven't uh, somebody that you're in a relationship with that you hadn't seen. Like we all live wearing pajamas most of the yeah. time, and then you know, all of a sudden, somebody comes in wearing makeup and is all dressed up, and you're like, "I'm seeing you with," you know, Justin Tranter. Like, Always looking fabulous. He comes well, in the sessions like dressed like a fucking look, star. He looks right, and I'm in my sweatpants, and he's like, "What are you wearing?" Like fresh eyes is Justin. about your love for Justin when he yeah. comes into sessions. Yeah. I don't know how he's getting. He's getting so many shout outs in this one. Hey, Justin. But I was going to ask you with fresh eyes. One of the things that's crazy is like it's such like in a way it's such a basic song, and the production has just the right amount of elements to to be fresh. Yeah. Something the, in it, like how do you make that song? How do you make that song fresh? That oh, great question. I don't know, but that song, my motivate, my uh, guidance on that song was just don't fuck it up. And that's actually that's I mean a lot of my productions are like you know, wow the the song you know we we did a great job writing this song. Now how do I make sure I phrase it the best way to not fuck it up? Yeah, you know, like the original version of Fresh Eyes was all eight oh eights. I'm just kidding, it wasn't. <laughs> no, but like, you know, how how to there was some vocal chop or something in Fresh Eyes. I remember like most of the percussion was just tapping the guitar and like really soft sounds that have like organic foundation. So it just doesn't feel like it's like you're departing from that vibe. Yeah, it's just don't, you know, in a song like that, it, it's I think a lot of um a lot of like the, the mistakes I made early on as a producer was forgetting how good the song is. You know, and then you keep throwing shit at it, and then like three hours in, you're like, "This is boring," and it's not, yo. It's like, remember how you felt when you first wrote right. this song? It's like if if you you know that for Fresh Eyes though, it was so like obvious that it was such a beautiful, earnest song that you know the only objective was for me to just not disappoint you and Andy. <laughs> <laughs> you kind of do the same thing in Bad Liar, which yeah, restraint. You know, it's like it was restraint, and then Rolling Stone makes it the the pop song of the year. Billboard. Billboard, Billboard? Did? or is it really Rolling Stone? Know. Billboard made it. The, I don't. It doesn't matter. Anyways, Somebody yeah, it got, made it it got it critical acclaim, which was. Funny. Yeah, it's Billboard. Yeah, Billboard. I guess it'd be weird for Rolling Stone to pick. Anyway, maybe not. But like Pitchfork made it track of the month or something, which was so weird for Pitchfork to make a Selena Gomez single. Why do you think that that is? Like, how did you? I do think that. that uh, I mean. How did wait? How did I do what? Like I don't know. How do you make a Selena Gomez song? The song that Pitchfork is like. Write it with Julia Michaels and Justin Trainer. Okay, that makes sense. I th- I th- well yeah. I mean Julia came in that day and was like, I've been listening to this song, and she played it, the Psycho Killer song, and it was just like immediately we're like, well, let's write to that, you know, let's write to that bass line. Let's like do something like that, and we literally emulated the bass line and wrote to that. Shout out Talking Heads. Uh, the best. Yeah. Well, also, I think what's cool about that, a female bassist Yeah. in a band in the 80s who, like, you know, you listen to um, 
And the days go by or whatever that song is. And, yeah. And the days go by and the water hold me. Oh down. yeah, yeah. And the the the, the baseline the baseline doesn't I don't know if that's what it's called. Um but the the baseline stays the same no matter what the other chords are doing. Yeah. The, and the, that's just the, a the pedal, ballsiest move. The pedal baseline. Do do do. Oh. Do do do. And it's like even when the chords change, she stuck on the same bass line. It's like, and yeah. everyone was like, nah, that's sick. Yeah. I feel like that would be really hard to pull off in pop music right now. Yeah. Um, uh, so there's this uh, new song that you wrote that, that came out. It's, uh, it's called New Rules. Yes, New Rules. Uh, number one for, I don't know, like five weeks? Something like I think that. it almost got to five weeks, yeah. Four and a half weeks. Four and a um, half weeks. Is that maybe that's more number one weeks than Want to Want Me? Same amount. Yeah, I think Want to Want Me was only a week and a half. Well, See You Again kept Want to Want Me at number one for, I mean, that song right, is like, right. I think that song's Diamond now or something. Yeah, for sure it is. Whatever, Charlie. Um, new Rules, Dua Lipa. You Queen. are obviously spending a lot of time with her at this point. In your career, I mean, that's what happens. You know, you have a hit with artists. It's like let's put them back in and see if it happens again. But I mean, this is such a big hit, and it's so strange because of the other songs that you have are song based, and you, <clears throat> and then you and you produced them well. This of all the songs that are hits to me, the production carries as much weight or more in a way than the than the song. At least from Maybe. my perspective, like for some reason, like I listen to the production. I think the 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 track. I hate when people say this, but the track is a hit. Do you know what I Thank mean? Thank you. Did this come from that first, or was there actually like sitting there with a piano and guitar, and you wrote the song and then you produced it out? It, the first element of that track was the the shuffle um, little do da da. It was like I was, I, that, and that came like funny enough, like um, <clears throat> like uh, fresh eyes. From hitting a guitar, yeah, and like Emily Warren and Caroline Allen were were just talking about. They were talking in the background. I was just hitting the guitar, and it started with that, and then immediately with the chords. I think you know. I I listened to the work tape, and by the end of that day, it's like eighty percent of what the song was, which is crazy. But usually, no, it stays with just chords. It's a really but that song. Just song. it was just that was just a, a good day for for production. Do you emotionally deal with these things well? Success, like in a time um, like this, like like right now, today, you have, you know, th- or this last month, you have another song that reached the top of Mount Everest. Do you? Does it change any of your daily routine? I don't know. No, not at all. I mean, maybe that's a me personally thing. Like, but for the weirdest thing about new rules is that for some reason I, I didn't like it wasn't as grandiose and crazy as the um as Want to Want Me. Want to Want Me is like a big surprise, but New Rules was I, I told um Steph of the Monsters, I was like, I'll, I'll be happy if it goes, you know, top twenty in the US. Cause I just didn't think I, I was like, it's it's like swung, you know, like a swung hook that's not even really a drop, but like still, I don't like, like I, it didn't occur to me. And I think like the video, the music video is what really catapulted yeah, the song, you know, which is another daunting thing about music is that you have no idea how a song becomes a hit and like maybe the music video goes viral and now people hear it and now people love it because they understand the concept more. And like, you know, I don't know. I didn't feel, I didn't feel, almost went on a tangent there, but I came back. I didn't feel this. Okay, thank you. It's one of us. <laughs> um, I didn't feel it like as as much. I mean, I, I'm really proud of it. I'm I'm really happy, and it's inspiring that a song like that with an artist that isn't that you know well, that wasn't that well known in the states could become a number one. And I love that people love the production. I love getting messages from on Instagram from like producers are like you know how did you do this? How did you? They're always like, what preset is that? I'm like, dog, it's not a preset. Explore music more, you know. Well, what I wasn't. <laughs> Which Nexus <laughs> preset is that? Bro? What I, I was, I didn't say so eloquently in the intro, but I was trying to. Is that? I mean, that intro a, was a, very eloquent. 
Thanks. And well, I kind of wish you gave a- the whole the whole podcast in that. And what did you do just when this, you wrote? It's new the most energy rules. I have. Every I mean, people who listen to this have figured out that this is as excited and as angry as I get. And then out of nowhere, I do this intro where it's like, <laughs> uh, you know, one of the A and R guys that I was talking to about the song that you and I have coming out. I'll be. I'll be is, um, you know, when I said. Well, Ian should maybe Ian should do it, you know. I didn't say maybe. I just said you. I might have even said you'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> I, <laughs> it's like before I talked to your manager. Anyway, but it you was, have that power. I'll do it. It's you know, fun. I'll... It's interesting when you have um, the Ian sound is something that when you're not involved, people say like, "Oh, I want to have it." Can you make it sound like Ian? No, they don't. Fuck yeah, they do. No, they and don't. They do. And what's so crazy about that is one, you know, it was like when I was we interviewed Julia and I was like, "People now talk to you. when yeah. they talk about you, they just say Julia." People say things say like, Julia "Oh, Michaels. she's the she's the UK Julia Michaels." It's so weird. Like she's so now weird. she's now like people just refer to her as like Part of the sound, and when people, when A and R people hit me up and they say like, "Hey, we want, you know, like we're thinking something that could feel like Ian," me and you're that like, is "So weird, yeah," and you're like, "Whoa!" So I mean, weird. like that your is sound very... is becoming like like a sound that people refer to to other producers to emulate. That's actually very. I mean, that's a very big compliment. Humbling, yeah. That's crazy yeah. and disappointing. I'm sorry that like <laughs> it's come down to me having to be that. <laughs> I mean that's sad. Music's come struggling. on, guys, pick up yeah, the pace. Exactly. Let's go. What's happening? Up okay, and comers. so come we're on. gonna do uh, the next segment where I'm gonna name five people. Okay, and you are gonna tell me the first thing that comes off the top of your. Oh fuck. Okay. All I right. mean, it's really it's not that big of a deal. Like I'm worried about earlier saying you know Julia annoys me. Like I mean that with love. You know I fucking love her. You know we've we've had sessions where she stormed out of the room, or we're both just bawling writing a song. Like you know, I say it all with love. Okay, I love you, Julia. Cool. That that was the first one. So you answered that. Julia Michaels. Yeah, that literally is the first one. I swear. Look, total pain in the ass. The list, um, but... No, just kidding. Oh no, you know if 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 it's like the first thing that comes to your mind. Yeah. If we're talking about songwriting, Julia Michaels is honesty. Oh, cool. Realness. You know, like like conversational lyrics, like the best, like. Shortcut, <laughs> shortcut to feelings. You know, like the most efficient, most honest lyrics you'll ever hear. Dua Lipa, amazing, beautiful person, Gra- amazing voice. Yeah. Do I have to have one word, or is it? No, like it doesn't really matter. There aren't any rules. Her voice, um, her voice. Speaking of rules, her voice made new rules. Well, so she's a, you know, she's a true alto. Yes. Who can? Who is super nice in the room? It, mm-hmm. Anybody who gets to work with her leaves that being like that. That's the n- nicest. She's so she's very nice. To everybody she gives everyone attention. She's not like um, she does not act like a pop star. Not at all. She turns it off and on. Like she she's just she's when she's on stage, it's like oh my god, do a Lipa, and then you're in the room with her, and it's like do a yeah. you know, hey like you know normal person. Andy Grammer, pure. Pure heart, right? The yeah. the the the, exam, the example of like the struggling musician who just persists. You know, didn't he play on Third Street for like a few years? Yeah. And like, I think he might he might have some disease that like he's permanently smiling. <laughs> right? Yeah, he's, exactly. We're on to you. We're on to you, Andy. Simon Wilcox. Wow. I mean, Simon's like one of the. One of the um, original gangsters. My first, my first successful song was because of Simon. And you guys, you know, you guys are in a way. I want to say love for like all these people. You know, it's like, like you said, community, right? It's like so nice, my friends. And number five is Dan Patel, your manager, who also is with Simon. So I, I, I feel like there's like you guys are you and Simon are almost. Uh, we, Related in some yeah, way. Yeah. Well, we like, were the first two, technically the first two clients. Of Dan. When Dan got into managing. So I Dan mean, Patel, number five. Oh, my everything. He, I would be nothing without Dan. <laughs> this is a, this is when someone like breaks down, you know. And, and I won't do it. Whatever, Dan. No, but he's uh, I mean, like the best. He's the best manager in the business. The guy is. 
because you know I think it's important in a, for a manager to be like grounded, you know, and and he is. It's like you know, because like I mean, maybe not everyone, but like certainly me. Like I'm a very emotional person, and I go absolutely nuts sometimes, and you know, get angry at things I shouldn't get angry at, and make emotional decisions. And he's always there to like balance that out. So he does a great job, and he goes, you know, way above and beyond all duties of you know a, a normal manager. Like the reason new rules exists is because of Dan. He was emailing for a vocal session with Joe Kentish, her A and R. I was like, by the way, I have this song, you know, check it out. That and that's you know that's the the, the beginning point of new rules for Dua. My manager pitched it. Not even the point of the email. The point of the email is trying to get a vocal session from some fucking jerk engineer that wouldn't send files because I was on a deadline. And it was like, by the way, P.S. You know, so P.S. Number one song in an email. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, Dan is. He's just like uh, you know. It's just the best, 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 best manager and friend. I'll give you one more. Okay, give me one more. Monsters and Strangers. Um, talented, amazing, full of love. Those guys too are so fucking nice. Yeah. I mean, it's like you. I feel like I, worked I don't with, know. I, I worked with you guys all as a collective, and when I think of like, when I think of the crew, like. You guys, as a community, were like, you know, part of. As Dan is calling you right now. Should we put him on speaker? I don't know if we can. Can we? Dan. Yep. I'm doing the and the writer is podcast right now. You're on speakerphone. You're on speakerphone. Hey, Rob Golan. Hey, what's something that you would say about Ian Kirkpatrick? What's something that I would say about Ian Kirkpatrick? Yeah, like like you're on the podcast right now. Uh yeah, like for real. All right, Dan. Uh, I'll talk no, to you no, later, no, bro. No, I'll call no, you back. How do you how do you how do you explain Dan Patel on the phone on speaker in one word or phrase? How do you describe Ian Kirkpatrick? Extremely fucking talented. I like that. Can you imagine if I me mean, after like singing like, his praises, he's like kind of a jerk, not, not really sure. Yeah, a little overrated. All right, Dan. I'll hit you when this is over. <laughs> he is so annoying. <laughs> um, Sorry, what was the last name? Yeah, again? I don't know how we use that, but we might. Um, yeah. uh, Monsters and Strangers. Oh. And just like I think of you guys as like kind of like one of the epicenters of the community. Yeah, I mean, those guys are, are definitely an anchor. Like, I, I, and I mean this in the best way. I'm not sure I work with them because. They're talented because I love hanging out with them more. I don't know which one it is more, but like every time I have a session with them, I'm I'm so fucking excited because it's just like you know the vibe is just going to be so good, and and that spawn spawns great songs. So, and that's sort of one of the mottos is like you'd rather have a a good day than a good song. Yeah, good songs come out of good days. Yeah. But like you come home from a session, you don't come home from a song. If that session is filled with a bunch of dicks. Like you're gonna walk away and be like, that was, that was an awful day. Yeah. And if the song works, you don't care. But yeah. if you walk away from that session being like, that was really fun today, yeah. and I can't wait to write with them again, you don't even know the name of the song. You don't remember the melody. You know, even if you do, like it's sort of irrelevant. Yeah. Like you just need to come home from work and enjoy it. Yeah. And then wow. You, Wow, they're like like the monsters are 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 a crew that will make you love your job. Yeah. It's crazy. Do you have I on the other hand terrible are someone that people come and leave and they go, "Man, that was What's advice really you'd annoying. have for a up and coming writer? Um fuck, I knew you'd ask a question like this and I thought about it and I can just tell you what I've been thinking about this week cuz it always changes, mm-hmm. but there, there was a quote that I read in a, in, a, in a magazine about design that I thought was so amazing. And it was, don't treat your audience like an idiot. You know, like when you, hear, when you hear a song that someone wrote and you're like, this is so bad. Or this, it's like, basically, don't think that I'm going to buy that lyric, bro. Like, don't, or, or, or girl, you know, don't think that like, People are just going to believe what you say, or, 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 or you know, is, or that's. I don't know if it's good to say like don't don't think that's good enough, but like I think a lot of 
you know, when I hear young writers, I think a lot, a few of them, not a lot of them, a few of them are just incredibly lazy with lyrics. Like they'll play, you know, they're playing catch up with the radio or something. And, 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 and literally, like I hear the song and I'm insulted. I'm like, you want to do pop music and you're giving me this? Like, bro, listen to what's on the radio. Like, do your homework. You know, listen to those lyrics. You know how you feel something there? Like, I think, you know, don't treat your audience like an idiot. Don't think that, you know, push yourself. Be, try to be, you know, smart. And, and there's, there's a common ground for smart and still feeling. And, and it's like, you know, I just, I don't, I don't like it when people are lazy with lyrics. You're never lazy with lyrics. You know, you, you sit there and you will, we will talk for two hours. You'll revisit lines because it's like, and, and, and it'll blow my mind because I'm like, oh my God, I never thought about that because I'm too close to the song, you know? It's like, that's what, you know, I think that's what makes you such a great writer is that you're very, you know, what's the word? Dyslexic. <laughs> <laughs> No, on some level I joke about that, but I really think that that when I look at lyrics and I'm like, oh yeah, I I, I read it wrong five minutes later, and it's like that would be funny if it was actually the other meaning. Like, yeah, I think I naturally have like I know that that I was like half kidding, but I actually think that after time that might be an advantage. <laughs> Absolutely. So don't treat your audience like an idiot, yeah. and also don't be so precious. You know, learn to. Let respect go. your audience for sure. Yeah, respect your audience. Don't 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 give me a song that sounds like a songwriter wrote it. Don't give me those buzzwords. It's you know, not a yeah. Don't give me love is your writer. drug and you know stole my heart like a criminal. Fuck off with that bullshit. You know, find a new way. Like of course you know a lot of songs are about love and heartbreak and and you know find a new way to say that. Don't just regurgitate some you know tried bullshit. Yeah, it makes me angry. I get so angry. Yeah. It's like calm down, bro. What's wrong with you? I don't know. And it's like some really nice writer, young writer comes to me, what do you think? I'm like, this is fucking, what the fuck? <laughs> Just get, get the fuck out of here. Out of here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't know. It, it, but it, it's like, and it's also because, you know, it, it was in those two years of not getting any cuts, I went through, you know, and I would listen to the radio and be like, why, is my sh- why does my shit suck? Why am I not, why is this not working, you know? And, and Someone said, that, and I thought this was good advice. It was, so, you know, when you're listening to the radio, and this is so obvious, but, you know the radio, Kiss FM or K Rock or whatever. You know your pop station, your rock station, your rap station, whatever it is that you're listening to. Like they have to put your song between Kendrick and Kanye. Oh my God! And yeah. you and they don't know who you are. I don't care who you is are. Is that song good enough that they're going to say, you know what? Rather than play this new Chance the Rapper song. I'm going to play this wow. song. I've never thought of it like that. If you're going to be like, if, if that pop station is like, I'm I'm going to play the you know new rules or want to want me or your song. Your song has to be as at the same quality or better. And yeah. if you are listening to your song, you can put it up. If you can't tell how off it is, then that says something. And if you are being honest with yourself, it's amazing how many times you're like. You know what? I could beat this. Yeah. I can beat this. I can beat this. Yeah. And like to feel like how let's often, just be honest. How often you get a, a message like someone like I, I've got a smash for you? No, you don't. No, you fucking don't. <laughs> Shit, like it's yeah. it's the it's the what is it called the um, Dunning Kruger effect? What is that? It's like when you don't when you're too dumb to know how bad you are. Oh, interesting. It's a it's a it's a like it's, it's like there was some psych- psychology you probably edit half of this out, but like. You know, people that performed lower on tests were the ones that thought they did better. You know, it's like you're not. Yeah. Oh, Eminem says it in Rap God. He's like, are you are are you smart enough to know what you? Oh fuck, I just butchered the line. It's like something along the lines of like, are you smart enough to know what you that like what you don't know? You know, it's like yeah. it's like you like you said earlier. You're like, I'm still learning. You know, yeah. you're a fucking number one hit song writer, and you're like, I don't know. <laughs> you know, I'm still learning. Every day is something different. It's like, you know, do you think? That people look at you as knowing the answer because of your success. Like now in the room, you're the guy with the answers because that scares me more than anything. When when people in the room look at you and they're like waiting for you to have the final say, and you're like, wait, no, 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 <laughs> that might happen to you. It but doesn't happen it, to you. It, 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 to you it, no, no, it definitely it starts. It starts to, but I'm always. Like I like, always have, when people like, are like, "Is this good?" and they look at you for the answer. Well, then I usually tell them that, like, you know, when we when we and I'll name some, you know, we wrote new rules. I I I don't know. It got passed up once, and I was like, "Yeah, the right doesn't really have a hook." 
like I'm over, you know, when I was like, don't be precious, like to a fault. That's me. Like I, I'm overly not precious to yeah. where I, I don't, I, I don't even like, I'll dismiss something or I, I, I don't know. Like I, I don't know. I don't have any answers. I don't know anything. Well, on that note of you not having any answers, sorry. First of all, thank you for doing this. Thanks for having me. And finally, just kidding. Exactly. <laughs> Fuck. I wanted to have some sort of bitter like moment where I was like, oh, do I need two number ones to get on your show? You, yeah. Because it felt like everyone did the show except me. Everyone in the room is like, oh yeah, I did the writer and the writer. And I'm like, cool. And I'm like texting Ross like, hey, <laughs> we'll get to you, Ian. Relax. That was like our last text. It literally is our last, <laughs> our text. last text message. But I, you know, it, it is a weird thing because you're, you know, you want to make sure that everyone gets a chance to say what they want, when they want, and how you can do it. And it's like, I'm glad. In a way, I'm glad that it happened now and not Me last too. year because now you have, you know, you had yeah. another number one song. I mean, I was never. You're gonna say in. Bit, I, I was never officially yeah, bit, right. but I wanted to. I really wanted to play that card when I came in. But, just be a dick. But what's weird? Like, <laughs> what's weird about all these things is like. You know your career in five years from now dead is <laughs> done. <laughs> <laughs> but like, so everyone's career changes so much so fast, mm-hmm. and you know it's like if you could go back now, would we do? Would we? Re- you almost want to redo some already from last year. Last year, yeah. You know, half the people are now have, now have five more hits or something yeah. like that, and you're like, I, I don't know when the right time is to do any of these, but. I will say this about you. It's always the right time for Ian Kirkpatrick. <laughs> no, I, in, a, in, a, in a real way though, I, I look forward to our sessions so much that in this point in my life, I'm trying to whittle out as much negativity as possible and make sure that I enjoy my days. Oh, so we're not and, working together. <laughs> no, but for real, I don't, I enjoy, I've never left a session with you and not walked away Feeling better about myself, feeling better about this session, about all of it, because I'm like I I I feel like I can be myself in your in your sphere, and your tracks are so dope and your music so good, and you still let me be myself, and I feel like somewhere in there it, there's. More of an ident- I don't know. I'm able to. I don't know what it's like to be able to be yourself around somebody who's able to be themselves, and then have these songs at the same time that sound like something fresh. Yeah, like I, I, that makes me feel like I'm doing something know, right. Actually, to hear you say that, that's, that's very. You know what that's, I mean? I, thank you. I always leave that feeling like I'm a. I am a quality writer who wrote a good song today and had a good time, and when I get the track back, I'm like, man, this track is incredible, and it. It elevated my writing skills, and you still allowed me to be myself. And that's really, I can't think of, you know, three other producers that I genuinely feel bring that out of me. Wow. And so, like, I, I, I appreciate you more than you know. And we've done a lot of, we've sold a lot of records together somehow. We yeah. haven't even written that many songs, yeah. but, yeah. you know, we've sold millions of songs together. Well, that's like an incredible yeah. thing to, to share with someone. I mean, I'm I'm so happy to hear you say that. That's amazing. I mean, that's I want nothing more than for you to walk in and just be, you know, Ross. Yeah. Because that's the man I love. And also, you know, I will always put that love into the music that we make after the session because you know I want to I want to do you proud and I want to you know. It's funny, like a lot of the like <laughs> I don't want to let you down is actually a big motivator. You know, into into to the production because any song you write with your friend, I think I think probably I'm sure other producers have that, but it's like you want to you know make your friends proud and like you know do your part, and that's the that's the part that I'm the only thing I'm really good at. So, well, thank you again. Thank you for having me. Really honored to you know be on this show, and and it is a show that I've learned a lot of stuff from. So, Perfect. really really happy to be here. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for listening to this episode of And The Writer Is. If you want to hear music from this songwriter I just interviewed, be sure to check out our Spotify playlist or visit our website at andthewriteris.com. 
If you like what we're doing, please subscribe to us. You can also like us on Facebook and Twitter. And the Writer Is is produced by Joe London, edited by Miles Bergsma, and published by Big Deal Music. A special thanks to David Silberstein from Mega House Music and Michael White. On next week's episode, we sit down with Charlie XCX. Until next time, this is Ross Golan.